Tomic Ober, Lesh on Commissioner Nikor Kamarag and Quinn, August Nishton, Chonga, Gaelic, Ephigul, August Tomic Tokyon, Gaelga, Ervwinagum. Um, I'm now doing Irish lessons as one of the other ways of broadening my experiences. So um, just to say it is a great pleasure and honour to be here today. Um, I'd like to thank um, Brendan, Dohi and Jill uh, for giving me an opportunity to come here and to really uh, engage with you on, I think, um, a very unpopular subject, which is the one of uh, optimism. Um, so if we have any catastrophists in the room, they may want to leave at this point. Um, I'm one of those people who believes that uh, public service has a duty to hope and that that's one of the things that Europe is there uh, as an enabling context. And the IAEA, of course, is a very rare uh, beacon of rationality at the moment in these difficult times by providing an anchor for rational debate on a very complex array of issues that we share as Ireland and Europe work together to shape lasting solutions. Um, there's a line from Yeats, uh, a phrase from Yeats, which keeps coming to mind. I'm one of the few people who actually uh, voluntarily pays to watch uh, RTE and the rest at night at home in Brussels. And it's the fascination of what's difficult. We seem to have lost the ability to deal with the things that are truly difficult in their complexity. And one of the things I'd like to do today is to not talk about banks uh, and interest rates and so forth in the speech, but actually to talk about what is a much deeper problem underlying all of the crises that we're talking about, something that we have parked for 10 years in a large part of Europe, strangely not uh, wholly in Ireland, which is the fact that uh, you have a choice in this globally competitive environment between speculation and innovation. Now, ironically, Ireland has embodied both in the last 10 years, and on the one hand, of course, we are dealing with the consequences of one, but on the other hand, there are very strong reasons to believe that both what is still happening in Ireland, which is a beacon of excellence and innovation, um, is a lesson in terms of how we must, as the European Union, fundamentally and finally deal with the problem of having sustainable growth as a basis for being able to compete in a world which is fundamentally changing. So I'd like to talk a little bit about really what is the deep uh, narrative of probably the, mo the most profound and challenging structural reform the European Union will now have to take, which is to develop a truly uh, innovative economy. Looking around the room, um, I see a welcome reminder of how Ireland's enduring reputation in Europe has been formed by a generation's commitment, innovation, progress, effort, and example. And I see many people in this room, uh, David Byrne, who I was honored to serve with, Brendan Halligan and others, uh, who have given a generation's commitment to building what is a reputation. Um, Europe, as they say, is not just for Christmas, it's for life. So uh, reputational uh, issues are very complex and diverse, and they move and flow over time. But we have a very solid uh, reputation in many respects. My role as chef de cabinet is to support Commissioner Maura Gagan Quinn and the work of the College of Commissioners at what we would call an interesting time. Commissioner Gagan Quinn is the global European face of research, innovation, and science, with policy responsibility for the structural reform of the innovation economy, the world's largest publicly funded research program, what you call FP7, that's 55 billion euros, cooperation with 131 countries, and responsibility for two commission departments located in seven countries. Within the commission, she leads the group of 10 innovation commissioners, and is, of course, one of the key and central actors in the forthcoming budget preparations. Uh, we also share a rather busy corridor with Ollie Wren. In this role, I'm acutely aware of the current economic predicament and the mood at home. I'm also concerned that the understandable, obsessive, compulsive culture of speculation about every conceivable twist and turn risks blinding us to the equally pressing task of addressing one of the root causes of this crisis. Many of the causes and some of the key remedies of this crisis are inextricably linked to the choices made and the choices to be made between false growth, property bubbles, dubious financial innovation, and sustainable economic growth, globally traded goods and services. Putting it in a nutshell, in an open, globally competitive multipolar economy, growth can be generated through either speculation or innovation. I would like to focus on this strategic choice where Ireland is uniquely placed 
to play a leading role in the transformation of Europe in the age of the innovation economy, or what we call the I economy. The strategic choices facing Ireland in an agonizingly acute way are a microcosm of the innovation emergency facing the European economies as we seek to anchor new growth in a competitive, open, trading global economy. One of Ireland's, modern Ireland's, unspoken strengths, and it's something which is counterintuitive in that we are uh, fairly good and easy to get on with as a bunch of people, but one of our unspoken strengths of modern Ireland is our ability to be serious about solutions. You see this in business, you see it across the way in which our academic, our business, our social environment functions. We have seen this at the critical junctures in our history. And I'd like to just draw attention, in light of the terrible uh, recent event, the, the, the murder of Constable Ronan Kerr, we need to remind ourselves that we are capable of doing extraordinary things. The achievement in working together to bring peace to our island at this point in time should serve to recall Ireland's ability to find solutions to the most seemingly intractable of problems. We should not forget this. Against the odds, Ireland is at its very best when history seems against us. Like other global tribes, the Irish are at our most inventive when a little lost. In this respect, we have become truly modern Europeans. Europe, too, is at its very best when countries like Ireland engage actively to co-create solutions. And Ireland has been and is increasingly uh, actively engaged in Europe. The contribution of Irish presidencies, Irish businesses, Irish organisations, Irish parliamentarians and Irish officials confirm this. Engagement is the motive force of European progress. Throughout this crisis, whatever your view may be of people or policies, the seriousness with which Ireland has attempted to address the issues has been a defining feature for most of the key actors. In the context of adding a European solution to an Irish problem, I'm convinced that this effective and serious engagement with Europe will prove to be a key asset in the long term. The corrosive pessimism and catastrophism that per permeates the current debate does not take sufficient notice of this critically important fact. And at this stage in the process of rebuilding and recovery, perception is not reality. Serious action defines reality. Whether it is the action of fiscal consolidation, budgetary discipline, the development of new European financial stability mechanisms, the ECB's extensive support, the, burden, the, the, the financing and implementation of the joint EU IMF programme, or the sacrifices that citizens are making in this country. Ireland and Europe have moved beyond the speculative into a serious and sustained process of stabilization, consolidation, restructuring and reform. As I said at the beginning, I'm not here to talk in detail about bank subsidies or about Ireland's debt position, but it is true to say that Ireland's efforts to deal with this are being recognized, as you may have seen in the statements uh, dealing with the stress test last week. Just two weeks ago, the Member States and the European Council adopted a comprehensive package of measures to respond to the crisis, preserve financial stability and prepare the ground for smart, sustainable, socially inclusive job-creating growth. These are the keynotes in a new European score of sustainable economic growth, where the conclusions of the European semester, the policy framework of Europe 2020, the requirements of smart fiscal consolidation, and the assurance of strengthening economic governments are emerging to form the other motifs and movements. And it's probably time that public uh, commentators started to understand the different elements of the score. It is admittedly difficult to keep up with this. Um, I think last night is a case in point. Um, it is a very fast-moving situation with many dimensions. The most rapid this is the most rapid and deep-seated process of European integration that we have seen. Where the implicit economic and monetary assumptions of our union have now been anchored in explicit commitments and behaviours. Once again, integration is responding to and transforming disruption. This is our European way. Europe is living through its third great transition. 
In its great transitions, Europe has moved from the age of reconciliation to an age of reunification. And now we are seeking to manage a transition to an age of economic renewal. The issue of growth in a global economy lies at the heart of this crisis. In a globalized, open, multipolar economy, there is an economic force of gravity which cannot be finally defied. Competitiveness is the global force of economic gravity. And beyond stagnation, the choice is to compete or crash. Speculation is the attempt to defy the law of economic gravity through dubious financial innovation and self-reinforcing asset spirals. We have known this in the Commission and in the European Union since the Lisbon strategy, which David will remember, that the writing is on the wall for an economics that is not grounded in sustainable growth. Sustainable growth is generated by adding value to the goods and services that we invent, produce, market, sell and valorise. And many of the people in this room know this from their day-to-day -day lives. It is, of course, underpinned by sound regulation, fiscal consolidation, economic stability and social cohesion. In a global economy, China and other impressive emerging economies are working single-mindedly to hardwire competitiveness into their economies further up the value chain to be able to compete and dominate markets in areas where Europe and the United States have traditionally held their own. Now, knowledge will be the oil in this next economy. Or looking at it another way, intellectual content will be the currency in the next intangible economy. China's innovation spending has nearly doubled from 34 billion to 65 billion euros in two years. At the current pace, if we do not react vigorously, China is expected to overtake the European Union in R&D intensity by 2014. I was at the presentation of the Chinese government's five-year plan last week, and it was like listening to our own policy. But the seriousness with which they are going to do it uh, was what was def defining. We know what the roadmap is, and we know what we need to do. It is a question of doing it. <coughs> the European Un summits, the European Council, Summit's first ever discussions on innovation two months ago took place soon after President Obama's State of the Union address. You may remember his reference to the Sputnik moment, the moment when you realize that your competitors have stolen a march on you. In response to this, President Obama argued that rather than admitting defeat, Americans should get focused, get united, and get ahead. The economic crisis is our European Sputnik moment, a moment when the difficult choices can no longer be denied. It is therefore a call to action. In order to compete, to generate new growth, employment, and to sustain growth within the context of the global challenging challenges facing us on energy, climate, aging, resources, and food security, we need to fundamentally transform our economies into innovation economies, to transform our union into an innovation union. For Europe, it is an opportunity to really change the way we do things. Of course, unlike the US, we're not a single country, but a family of nations and regions and states. But in certain areas where critical mass is needed, we know that we must combine forces to win. At the same time, most of the key policy levers have to be pulled at national level. Delivering an innovative economy requires deep-seated reforms across a wide range of policy areas. Education, skills, entrepreneurship, public procurement, venture capital, taxation, and many others. We need to stop viewing innovation as a sexual policy and start viewing it as a fundamental economic reform. For countries like Ireland, with a uniquely well-positioned globalised innovation base, properly targeted, the painful reforms underway offer an opportunity to come out of the crisis with an economy which is ready for action on the global stage. But to do this will require answering questions that are much tougher than the daily speculation on percentages and bond yields. The Innovation Union flagship launched by Commissioner Gagan Quinn last October is our response to Europe's innovation emergency. It contains a programme of bold and necessary actions and policies to transform Europe into an innovation union. And I may go into the details in this later on, but it basically works through the entire array of areas from supply right through to demand, public procurement, knowledge markets, the single market framework conditions, intelligence standards, um, creating a, a venture capital uh, ecosystem for SMEs so they can scale up and survive the valley of death. And at its heart is to make that what we do come to market more quickly. The shared ambition of the EU and its member states is to put in place a new environment for innovation,
based on a framework for business that promotes and awards innovation, leverages more private investment and attracts top talent worldwide. At the heart of the Europe 2020 strategy is the conviction that we need to innovate to get Europe back on the path to growth and jobs. And if the European economy is to take off again, we need everyone on board. Governments, local authorities, the public sector, universities, research centres, think tanks, SMEs, companies, large and small, and social partners. Alongside the economic rationale, by focusing European research and innovation on tackling the major societal challenges faced by Europe, such as sustainable mobility, climate change, energy security, or our ageing population, we can tackle these key issues, and in doing so, enable a new generation of European entrepreneurs to get out ahead of the curve and develop goods and services for our trade markets. The Innovation Union is our blueprint for using innovation to spur growth and jobs, but it will require a cultural revolution from research to retail. You'll be glad to hear I'm not going to go through the 34 commitments of the Innovation Union. I'll just name three main issues. Firstly, it's essential to maintain investment in R&D and innovation. Um, we need to prioritise what we mean by innovation, which is a deep uh, concept as the motor for growth. We need to focus on the key conditions for Europe to be more attractive for investors and entrepreneurs. We also need to build our European research area so that we have a market for researchers. We, we could create 750,000 research jobs in Europe alone. The European patent, which many of you will have heard about as a boy or a girl, uh, is coming to fruition. We're getting faster standard setting and we need to turn public procurement, which is 17% of GDP, into an instrument of leverage for innovative goods and services. And in particular, we need to, we need to make Europe the home for smart, fast-growing SMEs. Smart fiscal consolidation is a phrase I've used earlier on. In all the documents that you will see coming from the European Council, there is one exception in terms of public spending, and that is the, right, the, the necessity to invest in education, research, and energy. Smart fiscal solid, consolidation, which I'm glad to see from press reports today, continues to be at the heart of the Irish government's strategy, is critical in terms of using scarce resources in a strategic way. You know that we have a 3% target for public and private investment in R&D. We've had a long look at this in recent months. If we invested 3% of GDP in R&D, there would be an increase of 5.3% 5, 5 of GDP and by 3.7 million jobs by 2025. That's a conservative estimate. If you added to that the money that is being allocated in the structural funds, which is around about 86 billion euros in a strategic way, and on top of that, you are to use uh, pre-commercial public procurement, which is to try and develop the ideas before they're ready for markets or competitions in an intelligent way. The results are quite striking. We could have an increase of 8.1% of GDP and more than 6 million new jobs created after 15 years. That's a lot of the growth that we've just lost. The Ar Ireland's Innovation Task Force strategy is focused on getting this investment up and running and Ireland as a global innovation hub at the heart of Europe. Now, I just want to go on very briefly, and I'll try and keep it as short as I can, uh, to actually give some good news again about um, how Ireland actually gets globalisation and is actually very effective at drawing down funds in this very important area. The seventh framework programme for research and technological development, which is investing more than 55 billion euros over seven years until 2013, is focusing on developing excellence and bringing good ideas, services and products to the market. And in the future, it will be concentrating on doing that with a focus on these grand challenges. Ireland is a success story in framework programme seven. Ireland consistently punches above its weight in terms of the money drawn down. In the first four years of FP7, 6,700 applicants from Irish-based organisations have been awarded funding totalling around €270 million. Euros. To date, around one in four Irish applicants have been funded. Again, this is ahead of the EU average. A further 25% has been drawn down by the private sector, with a strong regional spread, with SMEs accounting for three quarters of the total. And the good news for Ireland is that Irish entities are on course to draw down 
over 600 million euros by 2013. That's well above our weight. There will be a launch of new calls in July, about 8 billion euros in calls, and there'll be a lot of work which we will do. I see Barbara Nolan here from our representation office and our information and our colleagues in enterprise trade and employment where you have uh, or it's in enterprise, Department of Enterprise, Trade and Innovation, Enterprise, Innovation and Jobs. Um, <laughs> a month is a long time in Ireland um, where we have a national contact point. And I think Irish companies, universities, SMEs and so forth can even do better out of that. So we'll, we'll follow up with contacts for those of you who are interested to know about how to get access to this. We're also in the process of preparing the next uh, framework program. Uh, one of the reasons why Maura Gagan Quinn is tearing around Europe at the moment is that we have a budgetary process where the Commission will be preparing the multi-annual financial framework in June of this year and as one of the major spending portfolios Commissioner Gagan Quinn is busily working around Europe with our European partners uh, making the case um, for the very critical role which the next generation program which will be very much focused on the entire cycle from research right the way through to the market. Um, and so hopefully um, as that process winds down she'll have our opportunity to come here and you'll get to meet the real thing. Um, we are in the process of a consultation looking at what it is that you want that programme to do. You have until the 20th of May to contribute um, and uh, we're very much interested in hearing your comments. We are going to make a massive reduction in red tape. We're going to simplify uh, dramatically. My commitment is that we want to get scientists out of the office and back into the lab. Uh, and it has just been a bureaucratic nightmare so far. But we also would like to see where, where, are the, where, where are the bits that Europe can reach that other programmes can't reach. Returning to Ireland, there's a stark contrast between the fate of the economy of speculation and that of innovation. In Ireland's innovation economy, grounded in intelligent investment and skills, knowledge and, and the entrepreneurial culture, which is something which was not there when I emigrated in the 1980s, and it's very much, it's everywhere you see it, the young people that you meet. I, I remember in the, the Your Country, Your Call uh, competition last year, the quality of people coming through who really understand how to function in a global economy is quite striking. The future is bright. In this, the real Irish economy, the fundamentals are sound. Now here's a few facts. The Irish are innovators. Between 2006 and 2008, 57% of Irish companies had innovation activity. That's the fifth best figure in the EU. According to Eurostat, in 2010, Ireland had the second largest goods trade surplus in the entire EU after Germany, to the value of 43 billion euros. I find it extraordinary that the, the, the figures of an increase of 24.5% in exports last year is something which is coveted around the rest of the European Union. Again, in this you see Ireland can be an example because our basic, as Maura Gagan Quinn says when she's talking about these issues, she says Europe is either open for business or it is out of business. And you can see that in the, the, the core heart of the next economy, Ireland is, 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 uh, is right at the, at the front. Recently, Ireland was also ranked globally as a number one destination for jobs created by foreign inward investment. We see announcements, even in these very difficult times, LinkedIn was another one recently, giving further credence to Ireland's continued strength. And Ireland's innovation performance in the European Innovation Scoreboard is above the EU average. <coughs> um, there are many strengths. Um, it's, it's actually a document worth, worth reading in terms of having some kind of comparative assessment of where people are going in different areas. Now, over the last few decades, on education, um, we've also seen a massive contribution in Ireland to this key part of, if you like, it's the engine room of the innovation economy. In Ireland already, 50% of the key 30 to 34 population cohort has a third level education qualification. This is the highest proportion in the European Union. And in recent years, the overall level of capital investment in Ireland has been high by international standards including in areas such as productive infrastructure, scientific research, technology and innovation. Ireland's export base is knowledge intensive, with around one third of exports classified as high tech. This is nearly double the EU average of 17%. In 2009, Ireland was in absolute terms the ninth largest global exporter of services, a rise from 24th place in 2000. So I think the figures speak for themselves. You've also got data which you can see on the Irish being more entrepreneurial than the average European. 
and that although SMEs contribute to employment at a similar level, there's a higher, a significantly higher contribution of employment from SMEs. Ireland's innovation economy and the know-how to operate in a highly competitive global market remains a critical asset to the future of both Ireland and Europe. In stark contrast to the economy of speculation, it can still provide a blueprint for how a healthy European economy needs to be structurally overhauled to prepare for the challenges and opportunities of the next economy. But for Ireland, given the understandable focus on the news of the moment, there is a risk that in dealing with the immediate crisis, the long-term needs of the innovation economy may be overlooked in public debate, but clearly not in public policy. I very much welcome the news that I saw in the newspaper this morning, Minister Bruton signalling um, very important news. You know that our, Dublin will be the city of science next year, which is a major uh, success. Um, and the work towards creating a global hub in research, science and innovation uh, is, is already um, underway. Some of the really hard questions on the road ahead very often do not involve money, but a commitment to ensure that Ireland is ready to compete to be the innovation capital of the next economy. And there are many questions which don't cost money, but that are extremely difficult to answer. I mean, we can ask ourselves in any country in the European Union, what are you willing to do to have a global top 20 university? Do our children, are they coming out of the education system trained to take the decisions in the world ahead for them? What are we going to do to tackle the supply of high quality science, technology, education and maths pupils from our schools into our universities? We have a significant problem here across the European Union. Will our children have the appetite to take the hard choices that their Chinese counterparts seize with relish? Uh, my kids' school in Brussels um, in the transition year, they now take the kids out to China instead of Provence or Germany. And uh, when the kids get up for breakfast, they realise that their counterparts have already got three hours extra science and maths done. You know, our kids and the kids in Ireland are not competing with kids in Dundrum. They're competing with kids in Shanghai and Beijing and elsewhere. Will our graduates have entrepreneur entrepreneurial skills as a mainstream? All of them whatever the discipline, because interdisciplinarity will also be an issue. Will our graduates leave college seeking to be employers rather than employees? Can we build upon the excellent ecosystems in different parts of the European Union to nurture and to scale up SMEs? And can we involve people at all levels in what is called social innovation, bringing solutions to the knotty problems that are facing our public services communities and generations at the ground level? And will we be able to ensure that people can re-enter the labour market, retrain and, and, and return throughout their lives through a system that is focused and working for them? So these are kind of questions that don't necessarily cost a lot of money, but they're a lot more difficult to resolve. And they're not particular to Ireland, they're, they're questions we need to be asking around the European Union. You'll be glad to hear I'm going to conclude now for those of you who still have the will to live. Um, I have tried to, in some way, reframe the current debate on a core strategic issue, which will prove decisive for Ireland and, of course, for Europe. In our understandable anxiety to plot a daily course, tacking our way through the immediate storm, we must not forget to keep a sharp eye open for our preferred destination. There is a real opportunity in moving from the ashes of speculation to the promise of innovation to get it right this time. The European Union is a negotiation between complexity and progress, between events and solutions, between history and innovation. It probably is the best political example of innovation in the modern world. And Jean Monnet's insight about why the enlightened pragmatism of Europe's progressive, consensual, institutional integrate actually works in the modern world remains true. As he suggested, when we're faced with an insuperable difficulty, together we must change the context. That change is underway. Thank you. <laughs>